What's cracking, ladies and gentlemen? 49 coming out, another community shoutcast for the OUSA Dota League Season 2. We're loading into a best of three a series between the Heroes of Old and East Nug, so it's the Group 1 playoffs. East Nug have first pick for uh, game number one, so it'll be interesting to see what hero they decide to let through the uh, first batting stage. Heroes of Old made up of a bunch of players who I believe neither none of them seem to have competed in the last uh, ODL. So all of them are, are relatively untested. I believe Bodajor might have actually been the commentator for the ODL last year, back before it was actually the the OUSA sponsored tournament. That's what people tell me, I'm not actually 100% certain, but we've got a Lycanthrope as well as a Doombringer band coming up from Eastnug. Very standard bands coming up from them, just because of how powerful those heroes are, either in the safe lane or in the off lane. And the heroes of old actually uh, spicing things up a bit with the Pandaren Brewmaster as well as the Silencer. And so the let's slip heroes such as the Tanker, the Faces Void, and the Titan. So the reason why uh, Silencers could be banned at this early on is because the heroes of old want to draft the lineup that has a huge number of uh, team fight oriented heroes. So for instance, the Titan or the Faces Void get hard counted by the Silencer. Since when Titan blinks in, if your Silencer's got quick enough fingers, you can immediately hit the R, catch him up the Silence. Mirana first pick, as well as the Vengeful Spirit, whereas East Nug, they're going with a much more conventional Shadow Shaman, currently the most powerful support hero in the metagame. Him and the Skyrath Mage are able to accomplish a huge amount for your team. Set up plays as well as a help push or a set up kills. So they're incredibly powerful in the sense that they're always relevant at all stages of the game. The only drawback with the Shadow Shaman pickup is he is very greedy and he is very slow. So a lot of teams actually like to run Shadow Shaman on boots at one just to ensure that he can get the Shackle off. Whereas the Heroes of Old, they go for the Mirana and the Vengeful Spirit. Mirana, you usually don't see her as first pick anymore. Ever since the nerf to her error. So no longer does uh, the same amount of damage. The damage is nerfed by 40. But that extra 40 damage is then added on to the bonus damage that you get based off range. And so it rewards good errors and punishes bad errors. Since the stun time also scales a, a bit differently. Venomance is being picked up as a second support hero. So East Nug already is sort of revealing that hand is a very powerful support duo that also uh, functions very well to push. And so Venomancer and Shadow Shaman work very well because you have the Venomous Gale to set up for the Shadow Shaman Shackle. And once you kill the heroes, if you've got a few points up in the Venomancer wards, you can use them to start chip nibbling away the tower. And if Shadow Shaman's got six, you can drop the Master Upper Ward to take a tower outright. And so third ban coming up from East Nug with a very powerful push oriented the lineup. They want to ban out split pushes or heroes that could beat them 5 on 5. And so very surprised to see that Titan has not been picked or banned, and neither is the Faces Void. These are two very powerful heroes that could disrupt death ball lineups. And Faces Void can help set up the rest of the team with the Chronosphere, especially with the Vengeful Spirit and the Mirana. Vengeful Spirit also works as a bit of a pseudo counter to the Faces Void, since if you don't catch the Venge in the Chrono, she can swap out whatever priority target you've Chronosphered, and you're more than happy to sacrifice the Venge in, ex in exchange for Faces Void blowing uh, his Chronosphere, since that's the majority of his team finding his damage. Also, ban coming out from THO, so very unconventional bans coming out from their draft of Feral. Good friend of me and Jamie's. Actually, this is the first time he's actually played in a proper team. I believe he, about a year ago, he stood in for the team that me and Jamie were in, but... So it'll be interesting to see how he performs with the rest of his teammates, who I believe are relatively untested. Hey, Red was also a temporary member of uh, Kai's team, Kaivi, before they disbanded. Viper as well as the Razor being banned out, so East Nug, very, a very powerful 1v1 laners, and the, as well as the Art will destroy us, so both teams freeing up a lot of space for the mid laner, since those are heroes that traditionally uh, hard counter a lot of mids. And so Temple Assassin is still available, but with the Venomancer pickup not quite as viable for THO. That's because a Venomancer can go mid, or if they ever rotate with the Venomancer, Temple Assassin will easily uh, fall apart. But THO, they haven't really shown their hand quite as much. The Mirana could be a core position runner, or could be a support runner, with the assistance of the Vengeful Spirit, since you've got the Magic Missile to set up for the arrow. You do have, and it's a bit tricky with the timing, just because Vengeful uh, Spirit's Magic Missile has fairly low range, as well as the fact that the stun time is fairly low at level 1. But it, more, it can be done, but we've got an Enigma pickup, so it's going to be, a, well, it looks like a Call Mirana with the Vengeful Spirit support. So we're going to be seeing a 2 plus 1. Enigma's a hero that hasn't been picked up at all so far in the ODL2, at least in any of the games I've casted. Very powerful hero, not only in regards to the, the teamfight power that comes out from his black hole, but also the macro advantage, since Enigma is currently the fastest jungler hero in the game. It used to actually be a toss-up between Enigma and the Lycanthrope. Chan and Enchantress also can... A vibe for power against the Enigma, but Enigma just is, if you're good with your jungle patterns and your jungle efficiency, Enigma flat out destroys them, unless if the Chen gets very lucky with a lot of uh, stacks and he's able to get a very early Wildkin. Batrider, third pick up at East Nine, very powerful offlane hero, but every time he's been picked up, he doesn't, he hasn't really been an accomplished all too much, because he gets shut down too easily. Since Batrider with the sticky Napalm nerf, it only adds half bonus damage to uh, neutral units and non-hero units, so it means that if the Batrider gets shut down in lane, it's very difficult for him to recover. 
And you never want to play Dark Rider from behind. You want to get the blink up ASAP, and you want to set up kills for the rest of your team, just because he's one of the best offlaners in regards to his kill potential. No other offlaner in the game can turn a gank around to a triple kill, with, the, with maybe the exception of the Bristleback, but even then, there are a lot of ways to counteract the Bristleback. Dark Rider is very reliable in the offlane, and against uh, unskilled or undisciplined supports, you can really run circles around them. Death Prophet being picked up, so t Heroes of Old really picking up, uh, starting to show their hand a bit now with the Enigma and the Death Prophet. So the third and fourth pick indicate their uh, preference for a uh, very fast early push lineup. And Tinker coming up from East Nug. And as with the Radiant Side advantage, it's going to be Bright Side New Zealand playing him. Tinker does a, a huge amount of work in the mid lane for the Radiant Side just because of the ease of access for the Radiant uh, Ancients. They're also a lot easier to defend. Since so you could drop a ward defensively to cover the Ancients and also give you vision of the rune and any gank rotations that could be happening to the mid lane from the top lane. And so Tinker on the, on the Radiant Side enjoys a, a much higher win rate because he's able to accelerate his farm. Tinker is one of the heroes I actually consider to be a little bit broken just because he's the only late game hero that can drag the game out to late game even with very little farm. Just the fact that you constantly have to walk into March when you try to breach high ground makes it very difficult. Lunar Band coming up from Heroes of Ult, so they're varying that aggressive tri-lane carry. Ursa Band also works as a bit of a respect band to Captain Taichu who has played Ursa in uh, two of their games up against I believe it was Sing 2 was able to take them completely by surprise in game number 2. Game number 3, unfortunately, the Ember Spirit and the Timber Soul were able to cut them around and blow them up. But that's another story. So the 5th man coming up from East Nug. They still have a lot of the reserve time left, so both teams haven't really been hesitating. They already have their game plan of executing it. And so there's two effective ways to draft. You either have a plan in mind and try to execute to the best of your ability, and kind of disregard the enemy team's draft, or you in favor, largely in favor of your own, or you do the opposite, where your draft is very flexible, you've got an idea in mind based around what your teammates can work with, but you kind of build your draft around the enemy team's draft. Both dra uh, drafting styles have their pros and cons. Usually the advantage of the reactive draft is if you've got a very if you've got teammates that have a very flexible hero pool, it lets you uh, kind of pick them and outdraft them very easily, especially if you could take them uh, off guard with a few unconventional pickups. Whereas the former, it gives you a huge advantage in the sense that it forces, if the enemy uh, team, if the enemy drafter is forced to draft reactively, and if the heroes that he picks up aren't necessarily what his teammates can play very well, but what he's picking up to give him the advantage on paper, you then have the advantage if you're picking up heroes that you know your teammates can execute well. It's the reason why PPD for EG is such an effective drafter, not because he necessarily understands the metagame or drafting as well better than any other drafters, more the sense that he knows exactly what his teammates are capable of and so he drafts to suit their strengths. So Tiny pickups, so we're going to be seeing a one position Tiny with what looks like an off lane Mirana. So Tiny Venge over in the safe lane with the Enigma backing him up, Death Prophet in the mid lane, and the Mirana off lane, we very rarely see Mirana in the off lane now. The reason why is with the arrow nerf especially, she is much less reliable. And that means that you, your arrows have to be further out to achieve the same result, as well as the fact that Mirana compared to every other offlaner in the game, has incredibly low base damage, and so if she's left alone against the carry, she can't contest for CS, so they'll just be able to out-deny her and out-CS her. The advantage of the Mirana in the offlane is she's very uh, difficult to get a gank off if you've got a safety ward up or if you're able to leap out before they get any of the spells off, so if you've got good awareness and good reflexes, it's very difficult to gank an uh, offlane Mirana, and you can always rotate to the mid lane and set up arrow ganks on your own, and so there's always that uh, extra pressure that you're exerting on the enemy team, but the drawback to it is she needs a fair amount of farm. They're going for a Sven pickup. I really dislike Sven as a carry position hero, just because he needs so much farm to be effective that you're better off picking up another carry, especially against a carry such as a Tiny that completely destroys every other melee carry, and that's because it's a craggy exterior. And so if you're within 300 units, I think it's 300 or 400 units of range, you go in for a right click. There's a chance you could bash yourself. And you don't. You never want to leave anything for chance, especially since uh, Sven has BKB charges since he'll be forced to pick up a BKB against his lineup, otherwise get completely destroyed by Tiny. It's a magic damage combo. Uh, once his BKB charges start to wear off, the chances of him being able to uh, stun himself through the Kragi can completely turn a man fight if they're going 1v1 up against a Tiny. Tiny as well also is very beefy, so he doesn't really care about the Shadow Shaman and all the Venomans. He can walk past them, since every item he builds gives him a huge amount of survivability. Whereas Sven, because he has such low armor and his HP pull isn't the greatest, and since you usually don't want to build too many strength items on Sven, the only strength items you should be building on Sven is the armlet of Medigian if you get it very early on. Since it synergizes very, very well with the god strength and the BKB. Every other strength item is okay, but not really great. You want to get a BKB up ASAP. You maybe want to mask a madness if you're going for that BKB route. And then you want to start getting crits up. You can try to swing the tide with a single big crit. We've got a smoke rotation coming here from the Heroes of Vault. And so just going to quickly introduce the players from both teams. Can't Catch Me, going to be playing that Enigma. 
Bother Draw though, gonna be over on the Death Prophet in the mid lane. Hey Red, gonna be the one position Death Prophet. Marder McFly, gonna be over on the Vengeful Spirit. At name, considering the fact that Vengeful Spirit probably will be sacrificing her life using that swap to keep her uh, carry alive. And Feral, gonna be the offlane runner. So, very aggressive early smoke rotation into the enemy jungle. That's to ensure that they get the safety ward off, as well as to perhaps even get a ward uh, to get a creep plant, creep camp block off, since the Vengeful Spirit does have sentries on her. On so, they're rotating in through the jungle, unfortunately. Looks like the boys from uh, East Nug, they didn't quite get the memo, they're rotating top. And looks like Parrot has four sentries, and so they're doing the pub level strat where you uh, deny Enigma's jungle by simply just warding off every single camp. And so its effectiveness hinges on if the Enigma is able to react to it. If the Enigma sits there and doesn't do anything, then you're achieving a huge amount. But the Enigma can always rotate over to the uh, Die Side Ancient, since ancient, this is Enigma can uh, Ancient over in the Die Side, utilizing that creep wave. He also can rotate to the enemy jungle. Which is something that uh, East Knight have to be wary of. But if they're going for a defensive tri lane, that actually could work in their favor since their supports can easily pull off and go kill off uh, the Enigma while their uh, carry is left alone against the Mirana. But it looks like they could be going for an aggressive try. Or maybe they're going for a level 1 gang, Mata McFly. He's going to be very careful. Caesar Cheese is waiting in the wings. Batrider boots first on him. Caesar Cheese catching another gang, Mata McFly caught out the stun from Sven. And with a few more right sticking Napalm level at 1 by Batrider, that should be first blood. And Captain Taichu gets and he's off to a fantastic start. You're off lane and getting first blood. And it looks like he's actually rotating over to the bottom lane. And so Batrider against the Mirana. Batrider actually has a significant advantage because with the sticky Napalm charges, we'll be able to out-CS the Mirana. The advantage that Mirana that has is she can't always leap away. But if Batrider is able to get a few stacks off, the critical number for the Batrider is if you get more than 4 stacks, the enemy hero is dead. If you get 4 stacks and you have 5 flare up, you just dive to them and you kill them. Because they burn down too quickly for them to be able to react. But great uh, reaction coming up from East Nug as they catch THO completely off guard. Martin McFly wasn't expecting that, and Enigma can't catch me. He's still he's rotating into his jungle now, but he just realized there's an, all his camps are blocked off. So he wasn't prepared for that. Doesn't look like he's prepared for dinner either. And so he's immediately rotating over to the enemy jungle. That's wasting a huge amount of time. Looks like he actually could be going towards the ancients. And the bot lane, Captain Taichu, already leaned to CS scoreboards. Feral, he's able to get some CS. Since Batrider will have to prioritize his own last hits over getting denied since you have to get that Blink Dagger up. But with that one stick charge and the sticky napalm, it's very difficult for Feral to be able to turn around and get that leap off. And so because Mirana has such a, a high turn rate, Batrider actually can go for a lot of kills over in this lane. But the way that Mirana can counteract this is when Batrider runs towards you, you simply throw out the arrow. Caesar Chase spots out Mother McFly. Mother McFly doesn't want to dance to Caesar Chase. It's a Venomous Gale, 15 seconds now. If you get hit by it at level 1, you are dead, especially with support so close by. Can't catch me, now rotating over to the enemy jungle. And so it looks like the, the Sentry Ward investment from East Nug, while initially effective in the sense that you have wasted a minute of Enigma's time, it, if they're unable to punish that, actually Captain Taichu has to be very careful then. If Enigma rotates in with the Malefice as well as the Eidolons, that plus an arrow could easily mean his death. But he's already having a pretty good start up against Pharaoh. Pharaoh's already been forced to use Leap, so Captain Taichu actually should be playing a lot more aggressively. Every time Leap is used, uh, you go for a, you play hyper aggressive. The same as the puck in the off lane. Every time he throws out the illusory orb, you play hyper aggressive. Martin McFly actually rotating over to the bottom lane to leave Hey Red alone against the Diablos on that spend. Not really too sure how I feel about this, just because Tiny does need a significant amount of gold before he becomes effective. And because the Sentry wants to completely uh, inhibit the Enigma's effectiveness in the jungle, and since he's forced to rotate to the enemy jungle, it means that Diablo, Diablo should be able to zone out the spend, but Captain Touch has to be very careful. Martin McFly catching off the magic missile. Can't, can't catch me, actually kills the courier. And so swing going now going in favor of the enemy team. Captain Taichu might be able to make it out unless an arrow lands from Feral and he catches him out. Fantastic five second arrow lands. And they get a retaliatory kill. But the Joe though. Give me down a clean up with the Crypt Swarm. It's an offlaner for offlaner. He did get the first blood and now he dies first. Hey Red, forced to use the Avalanche which I guess yes. Unfortunately goes in for the toss. Toss is back at range creep. So didn't quite catch on to the uh, toss AoE. If he moved a bit further forward and then threw the Avalanche back, could have got a lot of chip damage. Wouldn't be able to kill him. But will at least deal a fair amount of damage to them. Take all biddies, rotating over to provide some support. Now they can go for a kill attempt because there's no support over uh, to help out Hayred. And Bright Sun New Zealand in the mid lane having a fantastic time. 13 for 3. He should be having a fairly easy lane up against the Death Prophet. But while I say that, Captain Taichu spots out Can't Catch Me. And he burns him down in retaliation. With Tranquil Boots up on him. He's looking very good. I'm very unfortunate that the Radiant Courier was killed off. So it does give a fair amount of gold. So the gold lead is completely even now. Soul Ring up on Enigma, so despite his death, he's recovered fairly nicely. But in terms of EXP, he's very low. And with the Sentry Ward still up for another minute, 
Well, they actually should be wearing off fairly soon. He can rotate back into his own jungle, but the damage has been done. Enigma relies on having uninhibited farm in the jungle since he's the fastest jungler. And so if you leave him alone in about 9-10 minutes, he can walk out with Boots, Mech, Soldering. And he can start creating all sorts of health for the, the enemy team. Unless if you're going for the Blink Rush, but usually you don't necessarily need a Blink Rush, especially this early on. You can just simply walk up to them and catch him out with a Black Hole. Since you only have to catch, you can... Uh, it's worth it to go for one-man Black Holes at the early stage of the game, since the cooldown's long enough. But because, uh, while the cooldown's long, because the enemy team isn't going to be grouping up as five and going for these engagements, unless they're newbie, you probably don't necessarily, you don't really need it. And hey, Red actually takes a fall, and it looks like Gale into Stormbolt and Diablos is able to smack him down. And so the tiny pickup, really not working out too well, they need to put a bit more support over on his end. Feral can be left alone, or at least he should be. He's got level five, so he's the same level as the Bat Raider. They really don't need to hold his hand at all since he's a ranged hero. It's difficult for, for Captain Taichi to get a lot of uh, napalm stacks off. And Feral, he's taking a lot of damage from one sticky napalm. He's been zoned out. But that's what your offlane is meant to do. It doesn't really matter if uh, Mirana gets all too much farm since you can still contribute with the error and with the Moonlight Shadow. Tiny, on the other hand, needs a fair amount of gold before he becomes effective. And it looks like he went for a Basilius very early on. You usually don't see a Basilius on the Tiny. You don't really need it because you're only using abilities if you're going to go for a kill. You don't use them to harass unless you have a bottle. You want to be as mana efficient as possible. While I say that, can't catch me. Spots up by Caesar Cheese. Catch them up to Gale once again. And 15 second Gale can't catch me. Turns around the Malefist. Turned into a chicken. Tick all beasts today. He's got the shackle to lock him in place. A few more reckless from Caesar Cheese. Should be enough. Avalanche catches out too. Tosses him back up. Caesar Cheese gets one more. Never mind. It's Tick all beasts. And the Hell comes in. This support rotation has actually been completely decimated. As Tick all beasts takes a fall. And Bubba Joe, though, should be able to take the second kill on Caesar Cheese as he's fleeing for his life. He's got the TP scroll, but no mana. One more right click, followed by the Crypt Swarm. Just throws out the Crypt Swarm, then the right click, and Hayred punches him in the face. So, good response coming up from THO. No and that claws them back into the game. So, even though they're behind in terms of CS, and the gold lead still is in favor of East Nug, at least they're recovering in terms of experience through these kills. So if you're losing in CS and losing in kills, that's when things get very dicey. Bright Sun New Zealand, temporarily leaving vacating the mid lane so he can stack. You usually want to have a support do this just so he can spend as much time in lane as possible. But Brad's on New Zealand, he's being self-sufficient, and with that defensive ward up, it's going to be difficult to be able to spot him out. Looks like he's going towards the soldiering, and so he'll be having up fairly shortly. Very surprising to see that he actually chose to go for one point in laser. You usually see two points in laser on the tank here, especially against a hero like a Death Prophet. Because the only point in, in uh, heat seeking missile, it costs too much mana for the benefit that it gives you. So having that second point in laser gives you a lot more lane control, a lot more killing power. You just spam out the laser every time. Uh, it's off cooldown with if you're able to get rune control or if you have a soldering. That does a huge amount of damage in the Death Prophet, and Death Prophet wins mid by being able to constantly keep you down with the Crypt Swarm. But what I said, take all base, rotating over the Pharaoh, he won't be able to leap out in time, turn into a chicken, good response. Leaps as he gets caught up by the shackles. Unfortunately, the shackles are a bit too slow, and Pharaoh pops him in like Shadow. Magic Missile flies on Captain Taichu. Mana McFly won't be able to do enough damage to kill him. Arrow flies and completely whiffs. So Moonlight Shadow being expended. In exchange for one support rotation, Batrider unfortunately didn't have enough mana to get the lasso off. He really wanted to get that lasso in order to ensure the kill. Take all buddies if he's a bit faster with the shackle to make sure, even if he stacked it for half a second, just to ensure that Mirana gets locked in place. Could have maybe been a kill attempt, but good reflexes coming out from Feral, immediately backing away when he realized that Batrider is playing aggressive against him. And the mid lane, Bright Sun New Zealand, the ticking time bomb of the tanker. No one's done anything to shut him down. They've been ganking the other two lanes. They've been killing off the sports. Diablos also hasn't been inhibited at all. He's having a fantastic start. 45 for 11. That's actually fantastic CS. That means he's gotten almost every single creep in lane. I actually believe he's gotten every single creep in lane to have a, a CS score that high. And he's keeping up with 11 denies as well. Hey, Red, on the other hand, 6 for 2. This is when, the, you, when your one position hero has got less CS than the. Uh, Offlaner, that's, you know things are in dire straits. You want to make sure that he gets some kind of farm. Martin McFly should actually be top lane to bodyguard him, just because if they leave him alone right now, Diablos and Caesar Cheese can actually go for a kill attempt. Looks like they might be doing so. He's playing very far forward. The greed of the Enigma pickup. He's actually caught up in Stormball. Gale flies as well. Throws at the Avalanche. Unfortunately, only gets on Caesar Cheese. Tosses up Diablos, but Diablos should be to smack him down. And that's another kill going in favor of, of uh, East Nugs. Why well, Caesar Cheese actually taking a lot of tower damage. He's actually going to die to the tower. Never mind, just barely. That Tango region keeping alive. TP's back home immediately. So good recognition. Tiggle, but he's left alone in the bot lane. Pharaoh can be playing hyper aggressive against this. Choosing to go for a very standard Miranda build to maxing out the Star Storm. Actually, opted for a second point in error as opposed to leaving it at one. So the second point in error is a value point. And second, uh, two points in error does a lot more damage than uh, two points in Star Storm early on. So that you usually go for two points in error, then you start maxing out your Star Storm. That's the most efficient build in terms of uh, mana for damage. And Pharaoh, he wants to go in for an error over on Tickle Buddy since he's left completely alone. Captain Taichu, he's rotated into the jungle. He's actually almost got his blink dagger. 
And the Batrider right pickup, we're talking about how you have to shut him down. If you don't shut him down, he's still just as good as he was before. Only a bit harder to, a bit slightly hard to execute because he, his lasso has got much shorter range and less, uh, much shorter range. It costs a lot more mana, so 225 to compensate for the fact that Blink Dagger no longer costs any mana. Like Captain Tachi, go for a very conventional Bat Rider build, maxing out the Firefly, then maxing out the Sticky Napalm. You sometimes see a value point in the Flame Break, but ever since the uh, rework, and the added mana cost to the Flaming Lasso, you don't want to waste any mana at all, especially since Sticky Napalm already chews up so much, since you're constantly throwing it out. You want to ensure that you're wasting... Since the Flaming uh, flame Break is useful, the others are caught up by the Avalanche as well as the Magic Missile. Could be taking a fall, one more right click, and the Target Zell is secure with the Midnight Pulse helping out with that. And so they're finally able to shut down Sven, but he's already almost got his armlet, so it could be too little too late. And right down New Zealand, he's got his boots of travel, so the core items are up for two of the three cores. You've got the Blink Tag on Captain Taichu, who's actually uh, used it to hide himself in the trees, waiting until Feral sees him, uh, reveals himself in the lane, and then he can go in for a gank. Feral's actually rotating to the mid lane, or maybe he's trying to catch out uh, Captain Taichu, but while that's happening, take all biddies. He's almost level 6, so a good recognition coming in from Easter. As both the supports are actually getting a lot of farm and a lot of experience, Marta McFly. Level 4, Enigma, level 5.5, this is the fastest uh, jungler here in the game. Because of the early sentry pressure, he hasn't really been able to recover all too well. Death Prophet is keeping up CS, he's the only one that really is. March being dropped, right to throws out the uh, missile, doesn't have enough mana for the laser, he's got it, but there's only one point. Arrow flies out by Feral, actually catches him. Don't know where the hell that, it looks like that arrow completely whiffed, but with that arrow, it should be the kill on uh, Brightside. His brother Joel throws out one more right click. And Brightside New Zealand, he wanted it, if he had two points in laser instead of that extra point in the missile, he, that would have been a kill. So they are finally able to kill off the Tenku. But he's building towards his Blink Tiger. Captain Taichu, Firefly still up. Wants to go in for a pick off. The Heroes of Old, they do have the better late game. Uh, actually, no, with the, with the Tinker, never mind. East Nug do have the superior late game life, just because Tinker's actually flat out the strongest uh, late game hero in the game. If you can't control him, he will kill every member of your team, or he'll turn them to pigs. So if he goes for the early Dagon build, which would work out very well for this lineup, because they have a lot of uh, lockdown. You usually go for Sheepstick if your team has damage, but you, they like lockdown. Otherwise you go for the Dagon, or if you're ahead, then you get a Dagon to stay further ahead. He can immediately kill everyone. A Moonlight Shadow actually be used and can't catch me. He wants to go in for a Midnight Pulse. He actually catches out two of the Black Hole. Magic Missile flies out. Captain Taichu immediately cancels by the Storm Ball. They're able to clean up two of the back of that. That's a good reaction. Diablo's caught up with the Avalanche. Midnight Pulse be used to kill off all the trees so he can't juke. He decides to keep himself back home. Call out the Malefist. And that's three. Fantastic play coming out from THO. Off the back of that Moonlight Shadow. The instant uh, Nigma accidentally body blocked Diablo. They should have backed off. They should have known that Moonlight Shadow was used. Since Moonlight Shadow is one of the few invisibilities, I think it's the only one in the game that actually doesn't give you unit walking. And so that's how you can tell uh, if a hero is invisible, since your hero will be momentarily a body block. Caesar Cheese actually eats a 3 second arrow to the face, Brighton New Zealand is there with the defensive march, so don't want to dive this Hey Red backs off, but the uh, Corpse Storm's enough to clean them up, and Brother though, Blink comes out from Captain Tachi, didn't go for the last though, hesitated for a split second, that was enough for him to be the back off. They actually could have gone for that, there was no error, no avalanche, those are high cooldown spells. He could at least turn into a retaliatory kill, but 10k, he's got 4 points up in the missile now, it's going to be incredibly difficult to be able to breach these tier 1s. And this is where, where Tenker excels at, at base defense. He's the most difficult hero in the game to be able to breach high ground, because there's zero, there's uh, no item in the game you can buy that will give you a way to be able to kill off the 10k or to ignore the march. With the Coddle, you can go for a BKB, or if you have a Blink Initiator such as a Titan, you Blink Ravage. With the Tinker, because he builds a Blink Dagger of his own, and because March has such a massive range, he's always going to be hanging back outside of Blink Initiation range. And so, Tinker, assuming he's able to play intelligently, is almost impossible to uh, breach high ground with, unless you pick him off outside the base. Um, so, if he doesn't, so long as he doesn't misplay, you should be good to go. Magic Missile flies on Captain Tachi, but he Blink dodges it, just as it's about to hit him. Good reflex is coming up from him. And Martin McFly feeling a little bit silly. It's the drawback of the Vengeful Spirit. The Magic Missile is a low range. Vengeful Spirit is very slow. And it's fairly easy to uh, destroy. So similar to the Wraith Fire Blast from uh, Wraith King. One of those reliable stuns if they don't have an escape mech. But if they have an escape mech, they can destroy it very easily. Diablo's Armlet Medigian up on him. So he's going to be hitting like an absolute monster truck when he activates that God Strength. You want to make sure you pop Armlet and then activate the God Strength. Since it gives you base damage, which is uh, calculated using your strength. And since Armla Medigian, when you activate Unholy Rage, gives you 25 strength. Even if you turn it off right after, so long as you use it before you activate your God Strength, gives you a huge amount. Stomp flies on Hey Red, but he's immediately backing away. They should be able to take that tail one. By the door, though, Yule Scepter's up. Uh, Diablos. Take off, but he's standing. He's got his heart messed up in one second. Decide to turn around if they're not too careful. Hey Red, unfortunately, is able to pick him off. And that's a double kill off the back of that. So good avalanche into the Midnight Pulse. 
And they should be the farm of those wards as well. But while that happens in the mid lane, Venomance is able to take out your mid tower. So while THO are ahead in terms of kills, the gold lead still is 4,000 in favor of East. Now just due to the efficiency of the network, of uh, their last hits, as well as the fact that they're taking all these towers. And in terms of EXP, 3,000 EXP lead in favor of THO. So the supports are starting to pick up on their levels. Venomance has got three points up in the ward, so he went for two points in the sting to give yourself a bit more value before you go for uh, the fourth point in the ward. And Tenken now has his Blink Dagger, so he's reached the point of critical mass where unless you're able to smoke gank and pick him off very intelligently, or if you're able to get a Blink Dagger on the Enigma, Vengeful Spirit's good against Tenken because you could howl into the trees and then swap. But Brighton New Zealand, if he plays smart, if he's able to constantly uh, shift Q the Blink out into trees or into unconventional trees, now because he knows that the Vengeful Spirit could be hunting him, it's going to be almost impossible to be able to pick him off. And while I said it, the CCG spots out Mighty McFly once again, he's got a swap available. Mother Joe though, he's catching him out the Crypt Swarm. Venomous Gale, and Nova drops as well as the Gale, so CCG, he doesn't really care if he does, he could actually turn around for a kill. Mighty McFly is burning up with the Gale, the missile flies out, finishes him off, Hey Red runs in, avalanches, then tosses, turns into a ch chicken. And can't catch me, he's got Black Hole there, last two's been used on him as well as the Shackle, unfortunately a stack there stuns, Tickle B's gonna be taking fall, as Hayred punches down and tosses him forward, he could use him Maleficent, he doesn't even need it, one more Reckling, Captain Tartu takes a fall as well, very sloppy execution coming out from East Nug, and THO quickly punished that, but Brightstone New Zealand and Diablos continuing to farm off in their respective lane, missiles flying out from Brightstone New Zealand, he blinks himself back, and with that Null Talesman, most likely gonna be building towards a Blink Tag, if he's able to get that immediate pickoff power with, for the rest of his team, he'll make these fights go a lot smoother. But he has to be playing defensively. He can't. Uh, Bright Side Island can't die. He's the saving grace for his team at the moment. Diablos, once he gets his BKB, he can run in and man mode. But Brother Joe, though, exploiting the uh, weakness with the heroes down and with the exorcism up, should be able to take this tier one for relatively with relatively little resistance. Tiny halfway towards his Agnum Scepter. This is when things get very scary uh, for THO. While they don't, they lack the superior late game lineup. Their mid game lineup is significantly stronger with the exorcism level two. Now that's online. Once Tony picks up an Aghanim Scepter, swinging that big stick, if you ever lose a fight against THO, you will lose a set of racks, and the, that's why the Tinker has to play absolutely perfect to ensure that he doesn't ever get caught out of position. Diablos, once he gets his BKB, that's when he's starting to have a power spike. Because Sven with the BKB, there's absolutely nothing you could do. You could run to hell the other way, and that's about it. But with the sticky net, the constant sticky napalm, as well as, as well as the Blink Lasso initiation, as well as the Venomous Gale from Seas to Cheese, that's enough lockdown to ensure that he's able to uh, kill whatever priority target you focus. And Shadow Shaman is actually halfway to his Blink Dagger, so he's having a great start. And Brights on New Zealand, vigorously defending all these towers. He lost the Tail 1 mid, unfortunately, so it does open up a map a bit more. It means that the Radiant Side Ancients are a lot more exposed, as well as the fact that they now have another ganking path into the jungle. But otherwise, he should be having a fairly a good time, just because, again, we're playing against a tanker, you've got 20 minutes to take as many Tail 1 towers as possible, to kill the tanker as many times as possible, and then to... Disable his means of recovery, so take out his Ancients, ward off his jungle. If you don't do that, and Tinker's able to get a bit Boots of Travels and Blink Dagger, it becomes incredibly difficult, unless you have specific Tinker counters, such as the Storm Spirit. Since you can zip in through trees, Clinks works as well, but the issue with Clinks is you have to go for a Blink Dagger on him, and you have to know exactly where he's jumping. And if you mistime your Blink, you're then revealed, he can just turn around, laser you in the face, and kill you while you sit there and march. Captain Taichu, he's pinging out Hey Red, he wants to go for a kill. This Hey Red, while well, he had a, rock, a rocky start, he has recovered fairly nicely. Last is going in, Brightside New Zealand comes, unfortunately stacked on top of each other, so the Avalanche only catches up Brightside New Zealand. He's going to TP himself back home, Flame Break flies out, and Hey Red, there's nothing he can do, tosses up Captain Taichu, but he's going to get burned though, he actually does a lot of damage while he takes the fall. And so if he'd actually, if he didn't panic and if he combo Tinker, that could have actually been a turnaround kill for him. But nonetheless, he does at least drive out Bright Time New Zealand back home. But with the Boots of Travels, he doesn't really care. He's almost got his Dagon. And once that Dagon comes online, the supports have to be very careful. Feral, Mirana has very low HP. He did go face drum, so he's a bit tankier. But the Vengeful Spirit, Mother McFly, could be eating a hu will be dying to that combo if it flies out. The advantage, though, of the Vengeful Spirit as well as the Enigma is they're both very beefy supports. Vengeful Spirit's uh, strength gain has been buffed. So she's a lot tankier. And with the negative uh, Halo Terra aura, it's nice if she dies. To the enemy team, they're at least getting penalized for killing her. But it looks like uh, Vengeful Spirit doesn't actually have any points in the Vengeance Aura. So Brighton New Zealand actually didn't shift you his Bleak there, so that could have been a possible gank opportunity. But Joe though, looks like he's going towards a Bloodstone. Really not a big fan of that item on the Death Prophet, unless if you're incredibly far ahead. Although that being said, he's got 6 kills and 0 deaths, so actually come to think of it, he is fairly hard, far ahead. If he had more CS in lane, he actually would have finished it by now. So it's actually not a too bad of a pickup in this case then. Since the drawback with the Bloodstone is you have to keep snowballing. If you ever, if you get it too late, or if that's the first big item you build, and the rest of your teammates need something else, 
It could be very dicey. Feral scouting it, leading the charge with the Moonlight Shadow. Take all booties, is hiding himself in the trees. He might get spotted by Hera. Hera actually spots him out. Hera flies out over on Diablo. So then Ventral swap back in. They clean up two of the fantastic combo. Brighton New Zealand throws with the magic missile. Sees the cheese, whips everybody with the gale, catches out Hera, as well as I uh, can't catch me if you can. Buyback's coming up from East Nug, and they're out for blood. Catch me if you can. Can't catch me. He's been killed by the mass serpent wards. You'll step up and bother but he gets lasered down. Diablo, he pops the uh, God Strength as well as the Unholy Rage. Hey Red gets caught up with the flame break, he's fleeing for his life, Stormball will be coming up cooldown fairly shortly, he doesn't have enough mana. And actually he's able to save himself off the back of that. There's a drawback, it's the biggest drawback of Sven, is like the Wraith King, he's very, because he's a melee hero, and because he's very slow, he's very easy to kite, he's got no reliable way to close the distance. So those buybacks were, you know, they were at least able to uh, defend the tier 1 and kill uh, the Death Prophet and Ender Spree. I'm not too sure who actually ended the Spree, I believe it was Tinker, yeah, so Tinker actually got a huge influx of gold. And that Dagon's now online, he's got a Dagon level 2. If he wants it, he probably wants the most efficient uh, DPS build in r relative to gold. Is you want to go for an E Blade after taking one, but if you, but because the enemy team uh, they have the supports have such low HP, and because Marana is such a squishy hero, if you go for a Dagon five, you'll be the finisher before you go for an E Blade, and having that huge influx of damage could be a lot more will be will guarantee you a lot more reliable damage as opposed to if you go for the E Blade, since until you get farm up the E Blade, that's five point three K gold you have to farm up. Uh, 5.1k gold, sorry. Uh, you're not really all that effective. You still can participate in ganks with the level 1 Dagon, but that means that you're wasting more time farming, whereas if you go right away into the Dagon 5, you can keep incrementally upgrading the Dagon, you can still continue to participate in these ganks. It, it means there's no uh, delay before you suddenly spike up in power. You're consistently growing in power, just not growing as quickly as if you went for the uh, E-Blade. So Bonadro though, that Bloodstone could actually be a bit of a, a missed item choice. Especially if the game starts to stagnate like this. Since they weren't able to take that tier 1, that tier 1 actually didn't even take all too much damage as well. The Bloodstone doesn't really give you anything if you're playing from behind or when you're playing and you're completely even, but since you're playing from behind like you are right now, you have to be as efficient as possible with your item pickups. They've got the mech coming, can't catch me, can't catch me, caught up with the Moonlight Shadow, sees the cheese, drops the ward, thinking they went for Roshan, he thought they went high, but they go low instead of catch up Diablos, he's immediately blown up, missiles fly out, massive ward's dropped on Feral, Feral throws on Arrow and Tiggle, but he's great Arrow coming up from Vengeful Swap, actually swaps back in, but it is also Mana McFly, not too sure what he was thinking there, missiles fly out once again, and they take up almost all his life, and take a Blink Sneak and finish him off with the laser, or with the Dagon, Blink Dagon now up on Enigma, they aren't able to, uh, really accomplish anything in the Mass Serpent Wards, it's a huge investment of resources for very little gain. Every time the wards are up, you either get a, you should be either getting a kill or a tower. If you're not able to get either, then the wards are completely wasted, and that's a very long cooldown that's been blown. Tinker immediately doing what he does best, blinking into trees, spamming out march, spamming out missiles as well, just to do a little bit of chip damage on enemy heroes. Bright Sun New Zealand can probably solo defend this, but the blink dagger from Can't Catch Me can take him by guy. He's actually blink he's moving forward very fast right now, and Bright Sun New Zealand blinks out. Doesn't want to leave anything to chance, especially since Tiny can throw uh, the Enigma in. So, hey, Red. Feral spots out Caesar Cheese. He's got an arrow online, throws it, completely whiffs. But Caesar Cheese goes to the left as opposed to the right. He blinks out now as Captain Taichu's there. He's got his Blink Dagger online as well. And so, the team with the uh, Bat Raider, if he's able to get a timely blink, always has the advantage because you've got some fantastic blink initiation. But unfortunately, he goes to, over to the trees. He thought they might be w walking into the side shot and then TPing out. But the though, actually TP'd up from right in front of him. He was just out of vision because it's nighttime. So a bit unfortunate, the Firefly vision nerf uh, actually ensured that Butterdraw escaped there, since it used to give you a full hero vision, so it was 1800. I believe that Redder has 800 at, uh, 1600 at night time because he's a ganking hero. Usually ganking heroes have better night vision than non-ganking heroes. And the Firefly, because it gives him flying vision, now I believe it only gives him 1300, whereas before it gave him 1800, the uninterrupted flying vision would have ensured that he got that pick off. But now that's only 1300, Butterdrow though was able to escape despite the very risky TP out. I guess because his teammates were there he felt confident, but Batrider can instantly blink and lasso him and drag him out if his teammates aren't able to immediately respond. Things can fall apart. Sven, well he was off to such a great start, he's taken 5 deaths over the course of the last uh, 10 minutes, and that has severely impacted his farm as well as his net worth. He's actually fallen very far behind now, so he's actually got he's got less net worth than the Batrider, and until he gets his BKB he can't really go into these engagements and stay, and stay alive. That's the biggest issue with Sven is he needs so much farm to be effective and he needs such so many things to be right before he's able to accomplish his job. He might well, you could just pick a much more reliable carry. If you had, such, for instance, like a Faceless Void, you don't necessarily need a BKB to fight. If you could catch out one hero or two heroes with the Chronosphere, you could start a fight and win a fight just off the back of that. Sven, you need the arm limit again to give you your damage, then you need a BKB so you could actually sit there and do your damage, and then you maybe want something like a Mask of Madness or a Crit so you could keep doing more damage. 
It takes you uh, too much to become effective, unless you have a hero like a Magnus who can give you the Empower and then set you up with a Reverse Polarity, but that's asking too much. There are too many me uh, moving pieces with the Sven for him to be effective as a carry, whereas as a support hero, or as a Genki, he works very well. If a bit outdated, just because he is so slow, and he doesn't really contribute anything outside of the stun. Sven actually armor talking it fairly low, but the Jodhog is going to get blown apart. Take off, but he's eats the arrow, so Pharaoh might be a turnaround for a retaliation kill. He's actually still alive. Bunny Drozo with the mech keeps himself alive and Captain Taichu four stops himself out to save him. Call out the Malefist. Can't catch me. Saving his teammates once again. And Pharaoh gets a double kill back of that. It's a good recognition coming here from THO. And Brighton New Zealand forced back. So he's got a Dagon level 2. Should be level 3 up by now. Almost as a level 4 Dagon. So when the Dagon uh, gets to the sufficient level, he'll be able to instantly kill the Mirana. And that's when Feral has to be very afraid because he's a good chunk of the damage right now. So the Heroes of Ult. Despite the massive kill lead in the favor, 11 kills in their lead, they're still behind by 3,000 gold, but the experience, 4,000 in their hand. Aghanim Scepter now up on Hey Red, so he's reached the point where he can now participate in these fights effectively, because he's got that cleave, as well as the fact that it increases his combo damage, increases the amount of damage you do from toss, and toss is two sources of damage, the damage you deal when you actually throw them up, and the damage they take when they get tossed back down. And so that's one of the reasons why toss is probably one of the best nukes in the game, when tied up, when paired up with the girl. It also has a huge amount of utility. But this tier 2 isn't going down anytime soon, especially with Brightside New Zealand. Camping it with the uh, March Machines. So he's level 14 now, so he's got all of his abilities maxed out. He's doing a huge amount of work in these fights. Caesar Chiefs was actually able to farm up a mech. And Tiggle Biddies, he almost has Blink Tagger, but he's taken a few deaths in the past uh, few minutes as well. And so East Knight, they had a great early lead, but unfortunately they've squandered it. Although THO, that being said, their 5 man uh, discipline and the teamwork has been working out fantastically. They know when to back each other up, when to back away. And Feral, he's been very slippery over that Mirana. The thing that Mirana does best as an offlane hero and as a core position Mirana is with the leap, she's very hard to kill. She eats a full combo from Brighton New Zealand. Unfortunately, he's out of mana. And Feral, even though he's, got, he's able to TP himself back home by leaping out. And Brighton New Zealand, he goes high, but unfortunately, she already TP'd back out. So if he had that upgraded Dagon, that could have been the difference maker. Can't catch me. Actually, spots out uh, to Captain Taichi. He's going to be very careful right now. Hey, Red, holding his tail. He blinks out. But can't catch me, blink low, just be to catch him out. And Brother Joe though is already waiting in the wings. He's got Bloodstone now finished up on him. Captain Taicho, he should be taking a death there. Midnight Pulse being used, caught up the Grave Silence. Krypton flies out. A few more right clicks, he can't juke himself through the trees, so there's no Firefly. Missile flies out. <laughs> it actually looks like the uh, Death Prophet misused him and yields to herself. That bought enough time for Martin to fly to take a fall. But Hey Red should be to finally clean this up. Captain Taichu, the Jukes of Justice, coming out from him. Brighton New Zealand, Blitz up very far forward. He's going to be incredibly careful to get caught by some disables. Bojo though, fleeing for his life. He's at very low HP. Dust catches out, can't catch me. Arrow flies off of Feral, hits Tickle Biddies once again in the face. Defensify Arrow being thrown out by Feral, and they should and they're able to disengage off the back of that, so they should have actually lost two more heroes. But because they were able to disengage so uh, fluidly, it's a uh, good discipline coming out from them. Feral, he was at the right place at the right time, so they would catch him out with the arrow. And Butter, though he was an inch from death, if he caught him one more right click from the Mana Matter, this poison thing, dark damage would be enough to be able to uh, kill him off. The Caesar Cheese, unfortunately, he did get a good uh, Nova off, and that's the advantage of the Mana Matter support, is he's also relevant at all stages of the game, until, unless the enemy team decides to uh, stack BKBs, or if every hero, or if every core hero picks up a BKB. Which the Mirana actually might be forced to, or if they're able to pick up a pipe, he's able to do a huge amount of work. And if you force the enemy team to build BKBs when they don't want to, Mirana never wants to build a BKB unless she absolutely has to. Or if you force one of their core position heroes to build a pipe, you're still forcing them to waste a huge amount of gold, so you're making them react to you. Captain Daichu, waiting the wings, he, he has to catch up uh, Hey Red before the uh, Mana Fly can catch him out with an eventual swap. And Hey Red finally takes a fall, swap flies out in time, so Mana flies now in the line of fire. Now Silver wants instantly kill Can't Catch Me, and went in for the uh, Black Hole. Brother Joe, though, fleeing for his life, Mana Fly. At uh, 1 HP, he actually ticks down, sees the cheese, gets a double kill. So he's starting to turn things around. Captain Tachi was still hot on Feral's tails, but with the face boots, as well as the drum and the Yasha, he should be too fast to uh, be able to catch out. So too fast, too furious. Feral, he knows there's nothing he can do, so he backs the hell away. And we've got a Dagon level 4, almost a Dagon level 5 up on the Tinker. The damage is real from Brighton, New Zealand. As he's been the saving grace for his team, it's the only reason why they haven't lost this game. Especially with the kill lead going in favor of THO, with, especially with the death ball lineup as well. The fact that Tinker was unmolested in the laning phase, Butterjo, uh, Butterjo, Butterjo though, was completely shut out by the Tinker. While he was able to rotate and find a fair amount of kills, because you left the Tinker alone, you fell apart. And that's the effect, and that's the advantage of uh, East Next Tricord lineup. Who do you gank? If you shut down the Batrider, then Tinker gets a great start. If you shut down the Tinker, then Batrider gets a great start, and Tinker can recover through the Ancients. If you go on Diablos, then the other two cores. 
uh, farm up their items, and then they can turn things around. And Sven, even with minimal farm, can at least participate in ganks with the Swarm Bolt. But he's got his BKB now, so that's a huge power spike. The issue is he's been constantly kited. Every hero in THO, with the exception of the, of the Vengeful Spirit, and even then he's got Swap, and the Enigma is very fast. Tiny with Grow is incredibly fast, especially with the Drums Aura uh, up on him. Butter Joe, though, he's a Death Prophet with the Yule Scepter. He's going to be moving at max movement speed almost all the time. Feral with the Leap, he's incredibly slippery. And he can actually, if he times it perfectly, he can disjoint Storm Bolts, and Storm Bolts are now disjointable. It used to be one of the few stuns that you couldn't disjoint at all. So if he times it perfectly, just because the way Wind Run, uh, Miranda's Leap was coded in Warcraft 3, uh, Dota was because when you leaped, it gave you 0 0.1 second of Windwalk, and so that's enough to be able to disjoint certain spells, but you have to time it perfectly. Observer Ward being placed defensively, Caesar Cheese. He places his own uh, Plague Ward, doesn't have any sentries, so it looks like he's building towards a Force Staff to be able to position himself so he could get in for the Mana to uh, Poison Nova. The advantage of having a Force Staff. Another four stuff in your team when you've got the Bat Riders. You've got that Skyhook combo, you blink in, lasso someone, four stuff yourself out. When you have another four stuff as well, you're pulling the feather away. But Caesar Cheesy runs into the entire enemy team and gets blown apart. No idea what the hell he was doing. That far forward on his own. Arrow flies up from Feral. He lands on Roshan. I actually could look to go for a Roshan engagement right now. Caesar Cheese spots it out. He pings it out at least with his ward. Feral. His items haven't progressed ever, ever since he's picked up his Yashu. It will be interesting to see what item he chooses to go for. Usually when you see a core position run, you want to build towards a Molnir Because the Maelstrom is a very cost efficient uh, DPS item. It gives you a lot of AoE damage as well. Since it doesn't really matter who you're hitting then. The Lightning procs will spill over into a lot of AoE damage in these teamfights. And the attack speed uh, helps out a great deal. Especially with the buff to leap. So it gives a, you the, move, the movement speed and the attack speed when you leap. As opposed to where you land. And it actually gives you a fair amount of uh, right clicking power. 32 attack speed being given, so with the 30 attack speed from the Maelstrom, 62 attack speed just being given off the back of that, and the more times you attack, the more lightning procs you get, naturally. And with the Vengeance Aura, Murano will actually start to right click very hard. The other alternative item you can build on the Corpus and Murano is the Desolator. And Desolator is fantastic because it resolves Murano's biggest weakness, which is her low damage output, since she has very low base attack. But the disadvantage of the Desolator is it takes a long time to build. It's an item that has a gradual build up and then you suddenly spike in power. As opposed to the Maelstrom, because it's so cheap, 2700 gold, you can pick it up fairly early on and it gives you a huge spike in power. And so it gives you a consistent increase in DPS. And, uh, DPS. You can use it to continue to keep the early game lead. So if you're playing Amaran um, in a very aggressive mid game lineup, if they, were if they weren't dealing with Brightside, they already would have every single tier 1 and tier 2 in the game by now. Just because with the items that Amaran has been building, they're very cheap. Mid-game oriented items that give you a lot of bang for your buck. Caesar Cheese, once again, going very far forward with the ward. But he's been pinged out. There's a ward being placed there by the uh, enemy supports. And he's got to be very careful. Tickle, but he's finally picked up his Blink Tanker. So he has that initiation now going from Butter Joe, though. Because the force stop himself. And the force himself forward. Catch him out with the Yules. And that should be an arrow flying out by Pharaoh. Catches him in the face. And Caesar Cheese, once again, takes the death. Too far out on his own. And Mirana's starting to get very, very scary, especially with the huge influx of gold that she's receiving. Brother Joe, though, probably going to be building towards a BKB. He needs it if he wants to stay alive in these fights. Otherwise, Tinker will be to blow him apart. And Brighton, New Zealand, looks like he's got a level 5 Dagon. A level, he's actually sticking it at level 4, building. He's already got a Ghost Scepter. Captain Tatcher should be very careful. Panic Ping's coming out. Looks like it's from the enemy team, though. And he BOTs him, and it looks like he's going to juke himself around. He actually has a Yule Scepter up on him, so it gives him even more movement speed. Arrow flies off and Feral, he actually tries to juke him, actually jukes into it, caught up the avalanche and then the toss, and he feeds another death over the Feral, was absolutely on fire, literally in this case, since the Firefly still was proccing on him. Blink Dagger now up on Sven, good pick up on the Sven, very old school item, this is an item you see in Dota 1, similar idea to the Wraith King, but the drawback with the Sven is unlike the Wraith King who's got to reincarnate to ensure that it doesn't really care how YOLO you play, with Sven you have to be a lot more careful. But the advantage of the Blink Dagger is it gives you instant time on target. You can immediately jump on him. He's actually going to blink himself out right now if he doesn't want to get called out. Especially with Feral there. Arrow flies out. BKB, he didn't blink. Blink was just delivered to him. That's a 10 second BKB wasted for nothing. He's going to TP out, but the Black Hole's going to come out from Can't Catch Me. Actually, Can't Catch Me chooses not to use the BKB. Brightside New Zealand now caught the Yule Scepter. He should be able to blink himself out, though. It actually turns around to Dagon. Use the Ghost Scepter. He's going to be very careful. He can't afford to die. He's now eventually swapped out. And that Magma Side ensures his death. So THO, they're able to shut down the one hero that was giving them a massive headache. And East Knight's got to be incredibly careful now. They're throwing away the early lead, even though it's still our head in terms of gold. The disadvantage of Tinker is he takes farm from everybody. And so he'll have extremely high net worth, and everybody else will be very low. So 15k net worth on him, but he's the entirety of your net worth. And so he cannot afford to die. All the tier 2 now is going to be taken full. And with the uh, Tiny available, they could actually even be losing a tier 3. It looks like they're going to defend this. 
They get a blink last initiation on Bowser, but he's standing low with a great uh, black hole immediately cancelled by the Yabos. So good recognition coming up for him. Yabos doesn't have his BKD, he used it early, so it was on cooldown. He takes a fall. Bowser, though, might actually be burning down to the adult damage. Sees the cheese able to secure the kill. Captain Tachi, they're able to at least get a retaliatory kill for that tattoo. But Feral, he still isn't taking the death. He's a big fat cash pinata. If one of the heroes can not, can smack him open, looks like he's going towards the death layer since he's been holding onto his gold. Unless he wants to build towards a BKB. Captain Taichu jukes out the arrow, so this time he doesn't screw around. He just gets the hell out of there with the Blink Dagger. And they're able to at least hold off their tier 3 if they didn't fight. The Tiny could actually have done a substantial amount of damage to their tier 3, especially with the Exorcism there. But he's actually going BKB online. And Butter Joe, though, he's about 300 uh, gold away from his BKB as well. And so once the two calls from THO pick up a BKB, especially if uh, the Amirana chooses to go for a BKB as well, things get very ugly. She actually chose to go for a Manta Style. Very questionable pick up on the Amirana. It's not bad of an item in general, especially in a ranged hero, especially with the mind games you can play with it. But the issue with the Amirana, a Manta Style on the Amirana, especially as your first yes. big item, is it doesn't really give you enough damage to warrant high cost. Manta Style costs a massive amount. Sees a cheese, eat a 5 second arrow to the face. Feral, he's gotten very good at that. But the issue with the mana style on the Mirana is the only advantage it gives you compared to any other item is the split pushing capability in the mind games. Captain Taichu fleeing for his life, but there's a TP coming in from Can't Catch Me, he blinks out just in time. Since the mana style, it gives you a 52% increase in damage. So I believe each of the minions deal at 26, at 28, so 58% increase in overall DPS. But the issue with the Mirana is her illusions are very squishy. There's a huge amount of AoE damage coming out from THO. If she pops it in the March Machines, the March Machines will be a kill him out. Captain Tachio called up the Yule Scepter to set up. Unfortunately, there's no arrows. So Feral leaps himself very far forward. He Yule Scepters himself to be able to avoid the Grape Slides. And Bright Side New Zealand's there. He wants to clean up that Cash Pinata. One more right click, and he gets it. He smacks it open. He's covered in candy. 1k gold up on them. That's almost, that's his E break done. Huge power spike for Bright Side New Zealand now, and THO have to be very afraid. If you get called out the E Blade Dagon combo before you BKB, about 80% of your life is going to be taken out by that. And Captain Taichu is out for blood. Minor McFly, you'll set that up. Last two is going to be coming online very soon. Catches him out the last two. Maleficent, as well as the Midnight Pulse, can't catch me. Does have to be the Black Hole online. Never mind, it's on cooldown. You'll set as well as the Exorcism. Captain Taichu taking a lot of damage. Actually, he's going to be taking a fall as the Exorcism cleans him up. Gale, uh, Nova lands on three. Mind McFly should be able to dive in the dot damage. Single Beast, lead, uh, swap forward. Mind McFly takes a fall. His teammates can deny him. No, never mind. Mind McFly cleans him up. And while that's happening, Diablo says, Sup, I'm going to take out your top tier two. Tier three now. Your racks are on fire. Forces out of the fortification, he's got a blink dagger, and so he can blink and disengage. So the blink dagger giving you a lot of rat dota capabilities, since he can split push and avoid the fight. Good recognition coming out from Diablo, so he knows that because they, they lost three heroes, they can't fight this five now. And so the only other option that he has is, while they're distracted, at least make uh, get something in return. Since Dota's a game where you never want to give anything away for free, it's a game of trades and checks and balances. If the enemy team win a fight, while they're taking a fight, you take their towers. You split push, if your teammates are caught out of position, if the enemy groups up as five, then you split. If they split, then you try to pick one off. Otherwise, unless if you're if you're confident that your five man is a lot stronger than theirs and you're able to push faster than they can push, so if you have the tower advantage, for instance, or if you have a dedicated pushing hero, then you can just five man down through the, one of the lanes and take their racks before they can react, or at least force them to respond. So you always have to uh, keep in mind what you could do to recover from bad situations. And Mirana with the Master Star, she isn't dealing enough damage to warrant a threat. The issue with the Master Star on the Mirana is for that gold, she could have almost finished her Molnir. Molnir is about, I think, 5,300? Around 5,000 gold up for the Molnir. Compared to them, which is similar to the Manstyle. Manstyle is about 5,050 gold. It might have actually increased with the nerf to its cost. So the Molnir, 5,600 gold. It gives you the highest increase in DPS in any item in the game if the enemy team has armor above 10. That's the only caveat to it. But since Tinker is 13 now, otherwise the Desolator gives the Desolator or the Daedalus give you a high increase in damage. For cost efficiency, but the Molnir, because it gives you AoE damage as well, and because it gives you the Static Storm buff, which you could throw on a hero like Hey Red or Can't Catch Me when he runs into the Black Hole, it gives you a huge increase in DPS. It's actually one of the best DPS items in the game for a ranged hero. It's the equivalent of a ranged battle theory. Helps you farm faster, helps you kill faster, and gives you utility on top of that. Whereas the Mantis Style, it doesn't really give you anything at all, unless if you're able to get some sick Havorce level mind game jukes out, and maybe get the Bat Rider to last through like an illusion. Otherwise, it doesn't really give you much DPS, especially since the AoE damage coming out from East Nog, especially with the Cleave on Sven. If he ever gets in range of Cleave uh, AoE with the Rani Illusions, they'll die very quickly. Even as a split pushing item, the Desolator gives you a lot more damage. The advantage of the Man Style if you're split pushing compared to Desolator is you can at least split your minions and have your minions right click to town slow siege. But you don't really need it. You don't really want a slow siege. You want outright damage or you want survivability. If you went for a BKB, that at least allow him to survive 
Initial damage output. Diablos looks like he's going for a hard Tarasky. He'll be very careful. Cold up with the Yule Scepter and his Blinks on Cold up. Forced to pop his BKB once again. Actually stands his guard. Might be the kill. Can't catch me. Can't catch me. Fleeing for his life. He's able to kill him. So he wasted BKB charge once again. But things could have gone very ugly. Brighton, he's He's hunting him. Dagon, e -blade. He's now caught up with the Grape Slant. So he's got to be careful. He eats the magic missile. Fail should be able to smack him down with Hey Red getting the last hit. So Bright New Zealand, he's got buyback available. And so they should be able to break a uh, high ground. Well, that's happening. That's Serpent Wards and Captain Taichu. Take out your Rage Racks. The split push is real coming out from East now. Great recognition coming out from those two as they realize. Well, bright side down, unless they want to buy back, they can't afford to defend, so they at least they have to draw some fire and buy some time. So they have to trade space for time and do everything possible to try to delay them for as long as possible until bright side's back online. Since he doesn't want to expend his buyback, especially at this point in the game, you want to hold on to it for as long as possible. Take all these blinks forward. Hey, Red pops his BKB, though, stands the ground, gets tapped and to Last two is being used to waste off the BKB duration. But like Captain Touch has to be very careful. Tiggle Biddies! Avalanche completely loose from Hayred. Catches them out with his own Yule Scepter from Brother Joe, though. He's rotated in. Grave Science lands on him. And one more right click. Flame Break, giving him a bit more space. What the hell is the range of that right click? Tiny's now a ranged hero. He's able to smack him down. He does actually have a fair amount of range. To 235. I didn't think 235 was that far. And Brightside New Zealand, he's going to be up in 10 seconds. But fortunately, that meant that he couldn't set up marches. So you're setting up marches now when they've breached high ground, so Tinker's actually lost his biggest advantage. Usually you want one or two marches up to instantly kill off the creep wave before they actually get to high ground, so they don't have no idea where the hell you are. Missiles are flying up from Brightside New Zealand, he has to do everything possible to be able to hold onto this Rax, they can't afford to lose the Rax, he almost blitz himself forward, catches that mana and fly, hey red, they can up, e it as well, almost lose all his HP, Diablos is cleaned up by Bunjo though, last two being used, Gale, uh, Nova catches, Captain Taichu gets caught out the star so Brian Zion playing himself very far forward, he's gonna be incredibly careful. He cannot afford to die. Air flies, I'm actually catch him. He moves slightly to the left and dodges. Take all buddies. Shack love and Brother Joe though. Brian New Zealand rearming from himself for another combo. And Hey Red almost dies to one E Blade Dagon combo coming up from him. Dagon as well. E Blade's then the Dagon. And Brian New Zealand shotguns down, Brother Joe. Brother Joe, Brother Joe. Ah. And Batrider, he bought back for that. Boots of Travel's up on him so he can continue to provide uh, split pushing pressure. And he's able to clean up that creep wave, so good recognition coming up from the and buying back. They're able to hold on to their racks. And with the range racks down, the creep wave on the top lane is constantly going to be pushing itself forward. It's because the range creep is the one that does the majority of the damage in creep wave. Now, with the super seismic creep, it does double the damage of a regular uh, range creep while having twice the amount of HP. It's able to kill that creep wave very quickly. And the reason for this is the creeps in uh, Dota 2, uh, based off the ones in Dota 1, they're built off the same engine. In terms of the Warcraft 3 engine, sorry, they're, they're not built on the same engine, but there's a lot of um, consistencies with it. Yule Scepter up over on Butter Joel, could have been his own. Yeah, uses it defensively. Where's the Dagon? There's the laser. And he just cleans them up. Cool guys, they look at explosions. And Captain Taichu just backs away while he burns. And since the Creep Wave, uh, they have, there's different damage types of Warcraft 3. This is something that's not represented in Dota 2 at all. So the Creeps, they do uh, melee damage, and so it's reduced by hero armor as well as by, I believe, heavy armor. And so the melee creeps, they don't actually do that much damage to each other, whereas the range creeps deal piercing damage. And so that's meant to deal extra damage to uh, units with heavy armor, such as the creeps. And so the creeps take extra damage from the range creeps, even though they deal about the same amount of damage. So that's why when you want to control creep equilibrium, you always kill the range creep, or deny the range creep first. Aggressive ward being, a uh, defensive ward being placed out, spots them out. Their own wards being placed out, and they should be able to deward that very easily. They, re they really should offer a gem on the Venomancer, especially since he's a cheese. He's actually been doing fairly well in terms of kills. Since Venomancer is one of the best gem carriers in the game for, as far as support heroes goes, because you can always drop the uh, wards to be able to clean up the uh, enemy wards for you. You don't have to put yourself at risk, you can just drop a Plague Walk. As long as you're in the 900 reveal radius for the gem, the wards should be the clean up. Man style now up on Hayred, so it gives him a huge amount of uh, cutting capability. But he has to be fairly careful, even though he's incredibly tanky. Tinker with the rearm combo, especially now he's got level 3. So he's got one, so it only takes him one second to rearm his entire combo. Can't blow him apart. Still sticking with the Dagon level 4. Very strange coming up from Tinker. Usually you see the Dagon 5 up. I guess in terms of efficiency, he realizes that he needs the sheep stick as a higher priority, especially once these Dag uh, BKBs start to lower in duration. Diablos, the spam pickup hasn't really accomplished all too much, despite his fantastic start. Just because, unlike a Wraith King, every time he blinks himself forward like that to the enemy team, they just kill him. They just turn around and stand their ground. 
The hero that he's focusing backs away, everybody else just right clicks him down, especially with the exorcism coming out from Death Prophet. If it was a Wraith King, at least with the Reincarnate, he doesn't really care if he dies, and you're providing that snare for the rest of your team, you're at least eating all their stuns, so you're being a retard magnet and drawing fire. But with the Sven, you could still be a retard magnet, but you're not going to survive, so it's not really going to accomplish as much. The advantage of the Sven over the Wraith King is that you, deal, you do deal a huge amount of AoE damage, if you could get right clicks and if you get a lucky crit, but it looks like he's going towards a uh, harder to rust, so he's just playing a bullet catcher for his team. He just wants to get tanky, get up in their face, and force them to deal with them. But the Elbow is actually very low. Roshan almost kills him. Mass Sudborn's been committed for that. There should actually be a sneak Roshan. Well, no one's looking. They probably should be going towards Tinker. Since the re the issue with Sven as an Aegis carrier is because his all of his damage is coming from his transformation spell, God Strength. God Strength then is disabled when he dies, and so he'll re reincarnate without the God Strength. And that's, the, that's all of his damage, especially since he doesn't have a crit. But that being said, if you're going to be playing the retard magnet and blinking forward, if you don't use your god strength the first time, you just draw fire, you, it can work out very well, especially since you're, you force the enemy team to have to deal with you. That's the advantage of spending blinking and blink dagger. You can't ignore him, you can't really kite him. He just jumps in front of you and starts hitting you. He forces you to then back away. So that's buying time for Brighton New Zealand to be able to deal uh, damage. Since he's the real carry for his team, when Tinker's picked up, he's always, he, you always have to play Tinker as the one position, just because he'll take all the farm from everybody else anyway. So you have to account for the fact that your other heroes shouldn't be as farm dependent. Feral's called out e -Blade and Dagon, they get shotgun in the face. And Feral actually picked up a Diffusal Blade. Diffusal Blade's fantastic with uh, the Mirana. Because A, it helps you set up easy arrows. You, you poach them and you throw out the arrow and it just kills them very quickly. God Strength unfortunately can't be poached off. But you can use it to purge off our Bright Side New Zealand's Ethereal State when he uses the E-Blade. It also gives you a lot of a chasing power. The other advantage to the Diffusal Blaze, apart from the fact that it's actually very cost efficient, it's very cheap stats that you get from the uh, E-Blade, the Diffusal Blade, sorry, in regards to how much agility it gives you and the damage, since the mana burn diffusal from the Diffusal actually stacks up quite nicely. It also propagates to your Illusion, so your Illusions actually burn uh, mana as well. I'm not 100% certain if it works like this in Dota 2, so this is the first time I've actually ever seen Rhino of the Mount style at a Diffusal Blade in the same, at the same time. In Dota 1, it did propagate, but in Dota 2, there could be a few inconsistencies. Hey Red, taking a lot of damage. Martin McFly, being a sacrificial lamb, blinks, uh, swaps himself forward. Hey Red, though, still caught out. Two-man black hole. Not really too impressive, though, since you're catching up Tickle Buddies and Captain Taichu. Not really the priority targets. Diablos, BKB blinks for him. Brother Joe, though, is actually forcing him all back with the exorcisms. The issue of picking a melee uh, 1 position, or melee 2 position in this case, against the Death Prophet, is every time exorcism's up, you can't fight. If you go to right clicker, she will kill you with the exorcism. Unless you're able to instantly kill it, but since she's so damn tanky with the with the uh, blade mail as well as the uh, bloodstone, it's not worthwhile to go on the death prophet. And Butterjaw, he knows this, so he's been building himself to take fire but at the same time, uh, be enough of a deterrent to, for them not to want to focus him. And if he has his blade mail up when Tinker e blades him, Tinker could actually potentially kill himself. And without Tinker, you lose every single one of these fights. Tinker's the only reason why they, why they even have a chance of being able to win these fights at the moment. As well as Captain Taichu being able to pull people out. So he's going towards the Necronomicon, so that gives him a lot of split pushing capability. So that means that if they're ever taking a fight in the bot lane, and Captain Taichu's uh, not in the fight, he can just keep BOT over to the top lane. He might actually be able to clean up the melee racks while that's happening. And then he can get the hell out. So Brighton side New Zealand, holding onto his goal, he knows that he has to have buyback for these fights. This is the other advantage of Tinker, similar to an Nature's Prophet or an Ember Spirit. Or a Spectre. Every time, if you've got enough gold for a buyback, and if you've got your abilities up, you could always just simply re-enter re a fight. Because that means I have to kill you twice. So it's great on heroes like the Amber Spirits. You can drop a Remnant before you die. When you die, you buyback, zip back into the Remnant. And have to deal with you all over again. Captain Taichu captures out by the draw, though. BOTing in from uh, Brighton, New Zealand. Martin McFly. Actually, Vengeance swaps himself out. And the Yule Scepter actually keeps him safe. A lot of Yule Scepters for both teams. So we've got one up on the Bat Rider, one up on the Death Prophet. Yule Scepter is usually an item that you very the only uh, Death Prophet's probably the only hero that's considered the Coron. It's every other hero, it's they it's a situational pickup. They're usually better pickups for the amount of money you're spending. Bright New Zealand split pushing the top lane, continuing to keep pressure up with all those marches flying out. He's got a sheep stick online, and he should have buyback. And so the team fight becomes incredibly difficult for THO if they want to. Since the longer the game goes, the more in favor it goes towards the Tinker. That's your BKB is uh, reducing in cooldown. Nine second up on a uh, Hey Red. He's only actually used it once, and the other BKB over in Butterjaw, eight seconds as well. So they're being fairly conservative with their BKB charge. But every time they don't BKB, they get completely destroyed. The E Blade Dagon is no laughing matter, especially since when you're E Blade, you're disarmed as well. Diablos stands his ground. He knows the rest of his team is hanging around, waiting in the wings. Arrow fires are completely misses. So 
Feral Ash, actually corner out with the Storm Ball as well. Diablo pops his BKB, hasn't used his God Strength yet. He's got his Aegis the Immortal, so he's holding on to his God Strength for now. Captain Taichu catches out Hey Ran in the background, cutting him around, take out Bridges, drops the Master Overwatch. He's going to be very careful, he's taking a lot of damage. Mind of Fly catches out Seize the Cheese, Seize Cheese, gets a 2 with the Gale, drop the Nova. And Bright Town New Zealand cleans up Hayrate, Mario and Fly hanging there, waiting the wings. Mass Serpent Wall should be a clear, but never mind, the missile flies are turned. Butterjaw now turned into a pig. Stands his ground against Bright Town New Zealand, he's taking a lot of damage. You'll set to up on him. Blink Deck unfortunately won't be able to refresh in time. And Bright Town New Zealand's gonna be taking a death. Butterjaw though should be able to chase him down. Sven kills off Diablos in the background. And Bright Town New Zealand fleeing for his life, not able to get the ball charge off. He dies a triple kill, going in favor of the Death Prophet. He was completely unmolested, but he buys back into this. They take their first set of racks. And so THO, things are looking very dire for them. Looks like Enigma also. Bought back for that as well, I believe. Never mind, he could just still be alive. Yule Scepter being defensive, uh, aggressively used by Captain Taichu. But the though has his own uh, Yule Scepter, he's gonna die before he gets a chance to use it. And Diablos looks like he burned off his Aegis, then top popped on the God Strength. So good recognition coming out from him. And he's able to access a turn, forcing out the rest of the enemy team. Since if the big bad Sven's chasing you with a BKB up, you run the hell the other way, you can't fight him. And so Diablos smacking away at the tier 3. They should be the clear out the mid set of racks. It looks like I'm actually getting a message from a fellow caster. I'll reply to that later on. Bright Side New Zealand. Being a bit cheeky, he's gonna catch up. Uh, can't catch me. Turns to a pig. Dagon, E Blade, Laser. Trying to get the swap. Mind Refly trying to swap him into the jungle. But Bright Side New Zealand. Just bad manner marching in front of their fountain while they clear up the mid center racks. They should be able to be, get Mega Racks. Uh, mega Creeps off the back of this. And it looks like game one going in favor of East Nook. 14,000 gold lead in their favor. Even from the very uh, from the very beginning, they always had the gold lead. They never lost the gold lead since Enigma was completely shut down in the jungle. And because Tinker was unmolested, because they were able to get more CS, and they, were, they didn't attempt to block off the Ancients. Diablos, thrown up to the earth. You also have the Captain Taichu is there, waiting the wings. Blinks, he leak, blinks himself forward, doesn't get the last off. Time Diablos, pops his BKB, stands ground, tickle, but he runs in, decides to run the hell the other way. He's gonna die too soon. Not really able to accomplish too much of that. He goes Blink Dagger, so tickle, but he should be fine. They're able to disengage successfully. Bright Sun New Zealand. Waits till Hayred's uh, BKB is off cold and can go in. Actually goes on Marty McFly. Dagon Hayred as well. Take out Bidish drops a mess. Serpent Wards. So Panic Wards coming up from him. He does take a fall. Those Wards are going to get farmed up. And looks like Butterjaw going towards a heart of Tarask. It's two Rexes down. But because they weren't able to get Megas. The game. Uh, THO still can recover. If they're able to uh, kill East Nug and catch him without buyback. Just because of the sheer amount of pushing capability from the Tiny alone. They could just go for Ancients and end the game there and then. And so they do have that window now. Tinker actually, never mind, he kills off Butterjaw in the background. Forces the buyback, they know they have to go for his Hail Mary now. They can't afford to lose, and Captain Taichu, he immediately punishes it. BOTing up while they run down through their mid lane. He's got Necro 3, and never mind, it's on cooldown. He's got Chip Away over at the range tracks. And looks like Marty McFly, he's the, he's the one who drew the short straw. Yule's dodge coming out from him. Bright Sun New Zealand, stacking marches to be able to keep him out. Hey Red, he's tanking that march. It's not candy in those robots, it's damage, he's eating a lot of it. And if he gets called out with the E-Blade or the Dagon, they actually fell with a shotgun to the face. Diablos pops the BKB, Stormbolts uh, can't catch me, and this should be another kill. Laser flies up from him. Diablos should be the chase him down. And Captain Taichu takes out the range track. Actually, never mind, great juke's coming up from can't catch me. And Tiggle Biddies, he wants another fun. He wants to get a retaliatory kill, but never mind. Should be able to make it out in time. And Captain Taichu now goes on Marvin McFly, he's left all alone. Brett and New Zealand's also coming in, so we got some air support coming in. He shotguns him in the face. Napalm and lasers. Marty McFly, there's only so much you could do, and that's going to be Mega Creeps. THO, they went for a Hail Mary push, weren't able to do so, just because Tinker was completely unmolested this entire game. I, go, I keep going back and back into this point, because this is literally the one reason why they're able to turn this game around. If you don't shut down Tinker, he will kill you. He will kill your entire team. You shut him down, you kill him, you keep killing him. You have to treat him like a cancer, kill him with extreme, with extreme prejudice. If you give him an inch, he will take a mile. And there's a great 3-9 black hole, but well, Mega Creeps will smack it away your ancients. They are able to kill off Tickle Biddies. Actually, they've called out uh, Brighton New Zealand without a buyback. So if they're able to defend this and have someone BOT4, but Captain Taichu, he's playing the right Dodo. He's making sure that they never have an option to re-enter the game. Catches out Butter Jordan with the lasso. Diablos is there as well. Exorcism now ended. Di Butter Jordan, he's incredibly tanky. This Death Prophet's been doing a lot of work, but you just ignore it. You kill everybody else. And if it's just Death Prophet, Aeroflies unfortunately misses. If you can simply kite around the death wall or kill everybody else, it doesn't necessarily matter. GG, well played, it's been called. So 53 minutes into the game, East Nug able to take a very close game one. Things were slipping out of their control, but some fantastic tank player play coming out from Brightside New Zealand does secure them game number one, so we're going to be taking a quick pause. We'll be right back to game number two.